Simulacra and Simulation by Jean Baudrillard. Read by Steady Delta. Chapter 18 On Nihilism. Nihilism no longer wears the dark, Wagnerian, Spenglerian, fuliginous colors of the end of the century. It no longer comes from a Weltanschauung of decadence nor from a metaphysical radicality born of the death of God and of all the consequences that must be taken from this death. Today's nihilism is one of transparency, and it is in some sense more radical, more crucial than in its prior and historical forms, because this transparency, this irresolution is indissolubly that of the system and that of all the theory that still pretends to analyze it. When God died, there was still Nietzsche to say so, the great nihilist before the eternal and the cadaver of the eternal. But before the simulated transparency of all things, before the simulacrum of the materialist or idealist realization of the world in hyperreality, God is not dead, he has become hyperreal, there is no longer a theoretical or critical God to recognize his own. The universe and all of us have entered live into simulation, into the malefic, not even malefic, indifferent sphere of deterrence. In a bizarre fashion, nihilism has been entirely realized no longer through destruction, but through simulation and deterrence, from the active violent phantasm, from the phantasm of the myth and the stage that it also was historically, it has passed into the transparent, falsely transparent operation of things. What then remains of a possible nihilism in theory? What new scene can unfold where nothing and death could be replayed as a challenge, as a stake? We are in a new and without a doubt insoluble position in relation to prior forms of nihilism. Romanticism is its first great manifestation it, along with the Enlightenment's revolution, corresponds to the destruction of the order of appearances. Surrealism, Dada, the absurd, and political nihilism are the second great manifestation, which corresponds to the destruction of the order of meaning. The first is still an aesthetic form of nihilism, dandyism. The second, a political, historical, and metaphysical form, terrorism. These two forms no longer concern us except in part or not at all. The nihilism of transparency is no longer either aesthetic or political, no longer borrows from either the extermination of appearances nor from extinguishing the embers of meaning, nor from the last nuances of an apocalypse. There is no longer an apocalypse. Only aleatory terrorism still tries to reflect it, but it is certainly no longer political. And it only has one mode of manifestation left, that is at the same time a mode of disappearance, the media. Now the media are not a stage where something is played. They are a strip, a track, a perforated map of which we are no longer even spectators, receivers. The apocalypse is finished. Today, it is the procession of the neutral, of forms of the neutral, and of indifference. I will leave it to be considered whether there can be a romanticism, an aesthetic of the neutral therein. I don't think so. All that remains is the fascination for desert-like and indifferent forms, for the very operation of the system that annihilates us. Now, fascination, in contrast to seduction, which was attached to appearances, and to dialectical reason, which was attached to meaning, is a nihilistic passion par excellence. It is the passion proper to the mode of disappearance. We are fascinated by all forms of disappearance, of our disappearance, melancholic and fascinated, such as our general situation in an era of involuntary transparency. I am a nihilist. I observe, I accept, I assume the immense process of the destruction of appearances and of the seduction of appearances in the service of meaning, representation, history, criticism, etc. That is the fundamental fact of the 19th century. The true revolution of the 19th century, of modernity, is the radical destruction of appearances, 
the disenchantment of the world and its abandonment to the violence of interpretation and of history. I observe, I accept, I assume, I analyze the second revolution, that of the 20th century, that of postmodernity, which is the immense process of the destruction of meaning equal to the earlier destruction of appearances. He who strikes with meaning is killed by meaning. The dialectic stage, the critical stage is empty. There is no more stage. There is no therapy of meaning or therapy through meaning. Therapy itself is part of the generalized process of indifferentiation. The stage of analysis itself has become uncertain, aleatory. Theories float. In fact, nihilism is impossible because it is still a desperate but determined theory, an imaginary of the end, a Weltanschauung of catastrophe. Analysis is itself perhaps the decisive element of the immense process of the freezing over of meaning, the surplus of meaning that theories bring, their competition at the level of meaning is completely secondary in relation to their coalition in the glacial and four-tiered operation of dissection and transparency. One must be conscious that no matter how the analysis proceeds, it proceeds toward the freezing over of meaning. It assists in the procession of simulacra and of indifferent forms. The desert grows. Implosion of meaning in the media, implosion of the social in the masses, infinite growth of the masses as a function of the acceleration of the system, energetic impasse, point of inertia. A destiny of inertia for a saturated world. The phenomena of inertia are accelerating if one can say that. The arrested forms proliferate and growth is immobilized in excrescence. Such is also the secret of the hypotelier, of what goes farther than its own end. It would be our own mode of destroying finalities, going further, too far in the same direction. Destruction of meaning through simulation, hypersimulation, hypertelier, denying its own end through the hyperfinality, the crustacean, the statues of Easter Island. Is this not also the obscene secret of cancer? Revenge of excrescence on growth, revenge of speed on inertia. The masses themselves are caught up in a gigantic process of inertia through acceleration. They are this excrescent, devouring process that annihilates all growth and all surplus meaning. They are this circuit, short-circuited by a monstrous finality. It is this point of inertia and what happens outside this point of inertia that today is fascinating, enthralling, gone, therefore, the discreet charm of the dialectic. If it is nihilistic to privilege this point of inertia and the analysis of this irreversibility of systems up to the point of no return, then I am a nihilist. If it is nihilistic to be obsessed by the mode of disappearance and no longer by the mode of production, then I am a nihilist. Disappearance, aphonesis, implosion, theory of verschwindens, transpolitics, is the elective sphere of the mode of disappearance, of the real, of meaning, of the stage, of history, of the social, of the individual. To tell the truth, it is no longer so much a question of nihilism. In disappearance, in the desert-like, aleatory, and indifferent form, there is no longer even pathos, the pathetic of nihilism, that mythical energy that is still the force of nihilism, of radicality, mythic denial, dramatic anticipation. It is no longer even disenchantment with the seductive and nostalgic, itself enchanted tonality of disenchantment. It is simply disappearance. The trace of this radicality of the mode of disappearance is already found in Odorno and Benjamin, parallel to the nostalgic exercise of the dialectic. Because there is a nostalgia of the dialectic, and without a doubt, the most subtle dialectic is nostalgic to begin with. But more deeply, there is in Benjamin and Adorno another tonality, that of a melancholy attached to the system itself, one that is incurable and beyond any dialectic. It is this melancholia of systems that today takes the upper hand through the ironically transparent forms that surround us. It is this melancholia that is becoming our fundamental passion 
it is no longer the spleen or the vague yearnings of the fin de siècle of the soul. It is no longer nihilism either, which in some sense aims at normalizing everything through destruction, the passion of resentment. No, melancholia is the fundamental tonality of functional systems, of current systems of simulation, of programming and information. Melancholia is the inherent quality of the mode of the disappearance of meaning, of the mode of the volatization of meaning in operational systems. And we are all melancholic. Melancholia is the brutal disaffection that characterizes our saturated systems. Once the hope of balancing good and evil, true and false, indeed of confronting some values of the same order, once the more general hope of a relation of forces and a stake has vanished, everywhere, always, the system is too strong, hegemonic. Against this hegemony of the system, one can exalt the ruses of desire, practice revolutionary micrology of the quotidian, exalt the molecular drift, or even defend cooking. This does not resolve the imperious necessity of checking the system in broad daylight. This only terrorism can do. It is the trait of reversion that effaces the remainder, just as a single ironic smile effaces a whole discourse, just as a single flash of denial in a slave effaces all the power and pleasure of the master. The more hegemonic the system, the more the imagination is struck by the smallest of its reversals. The challenge, even infinitesimal, is the image of a chain of failure. Only this reversibility without a counterpart is an event today. On the nihilistic and disaffected stage of the political, only it mobilizes the imaginary. If being a nihilist is carrying to the unbearable limit of the hegemonic systems this radical trait of derision and of violence, this challenge that the system is summoned to answer through its own death, then I am a terrorist and nihilist in theory, as the others are with their weapons. Theoretical violence, not truth, is the only resource left us. But such a sentiment is utopian, because it would be beautiful to be a nihilist if there were still a radicality, as it would be nice to be a terrorist if death, including that of the terrorists, still had meaning. But it is at this point that things become insoluble, because to this active nihilism of radicality, the system opposes its own, the nihilism of neutralization. The system is itself also nihilistic, in the sense that it has the power to pour everything, including what denies it, into indifference. In this system, death itself shines by virtue of its absence. The Bologna train station, the Oktoberfest in Munich, the dead are annulled by indifference. That is where terrorism is the involuntary accomplice of the whole system, not politically, but in the accelerated form of indifference that it contributes to imposing. Death no longer has a stage, neither phantasmatic nor political, on which to represent itself, to play itself out, either a ceremonial or a violent one. And this is the victory of the other nihilism, of the other terrorism, that of the system. There is no longer a stage, not even the minimal illusion that makes events capable of adopting the force of reality, no more stage, either of mental or political solidarity. What do Chile, Biafra, the boat people, Bologna, or Poland matter? All of that comes to be annihilated on the television screen. We are in the era of events without consequences and of theories without consequences. There is no more hope for meaning. And without a doubt, this is a good thing. Meaning is mortal. But that on which it has imposed its ephemeral sign, what it hoped to liquidate in order to impose the reign of the Enlightenment, that is, appearances, they are immortal, invulnerable to the nihilism of meaning or of non-meaning itself. This is where the seduction begins.